Every Thursday night, you ask the questions, DT gives you his answers. No holds barred. It's Q&A with Don Tony. This is your chance to speak your mind and be heard about anything. Q&A with Don Tony. And now, your host, Don Tony. All right. Good evening, everybody. Channel members, Gifa. How's everybody's evening slash morning going for those who live overseas? It's Thursday night, May 19th. Isn't that Kane's Day? May 19th, 2022. Q&A with yours truly. And as you know by now on Thursdays, it's not just Q&A. We also get into a little bit of AEW, NXT, news, discussion, ratings, a couple other things going on. Um, I tell you, interesting last 48 hours with everything that has gone down with Sasha Banks and Charlotte. Uh, I'll get to Charlotte. Sasha Banks and Naomi, excuse me, jumping the gun a little bit. Um, you know, tonight, obviously, Q&A, you could ask about anything. Doesn't have to just be NXT or AEW. We dedicate a little portion of the show for NXT and AEW since we have not been doing shows on Wednesdays. Uh, now, I do have to let everybody know a little programming note tonight. We are actually going to have a three-minute intermission at the 10 o'clock hour. And the reason being is because Kev Castle is still on the Patreon channel. And every week, Kev Castle does his uh, show, and he's been having some issues with recording. So I offered last week, since I have another computer inside, I'll record your show as a backup. This way, you know, we know we got an, at least an audio recording. The thing is, he starts at 10. Usually at 10 o'clock, we're still going over here. So literally at the 10 o'clock hour, I'm going to put a little... Uh, intermission thing on the screen for about three minutes. I'm going to go in the other room, hit record, make sure the audio levels are good, and I'll be right back here. So uh, be prepared at 10 o'clock if you have to go pee pee, get something to drink, want to stretch your legs, go get something to eat. About three minutes intermission, 10 o'clock hour. Um, now, I want to prepare you all. Uh, something that I'm going to get into on Saturday. And it's going to be a pretty serious discussion. And I know it's something we've talked about before, but obviously now with what has transpired with Sasha Banks and Naomi, um, even indirectly yesterday with one, with a joker that appeared on AEW dynamite, because there was a lot of yelling and screaming today about why couldn't Tony Khan bring in Athena, the former Ember Moon? Why couldn't he bring her this? Why Why do you bring in a Joker from Japan? And I, and I don't mean that in any rude way, but um, you feel like people are being skipped to fulfill Tony Khan's personal, you know, Ring of Honor slash New Japan slash ECW fantasies. As a wrestling fan, it's his money. You do whatever he wants, and I will support it as much as I can. But Saturday, we're going to have some real serious discussion because something that is so obvious, no one has the balls to say it. The reason why nobody has the balls to say it is because Tony Khan's got to be dragged into the conversation as well. And the fact, here's a little teaser now, the fact of the matter is, you know, this 50-50, you know, we want to treat the women the same as the men. We want to give equal time here, equal time there. We want to keep everybody in the pay scale. That's all been um, nothing but talk from all the promoters out there through various outlets because they're not going to say it to you directly. But in the back of their mind, they know that pro wrestling is a male-dominated sport. It always has been. It will be for the foreseeable future with the exception of the all women's promotions and some that are much smaller. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, if women's wrestling was going to be treated with the same time, respect, everything, dedication, then how come they're not featured? 
on the shows? How come we only get one match when the men get five? How come this gets featured here? Because they just want to keep social media because it, it, it really comes down to social media. They want to keep the loud noise to a minimum as much as possible. Oh, no, no, no. We, we're working on it. AEW's going to have their three anniversary next week. Three years. And how do you feel about the women's divisions compared to the men's? You know, three years. You have all that talent out there. What's stopping it? What's stopping it? And look, AEW is not just at fault. You could go up and down the line with a lot of other wrestling promotions out there. And the reason why is because, unfortunately, splitting the time equally amongst the men and the women does not bring in the revenue that everybody, th a lot of people think it does because they've been being fed, you know, this narrative to appease everybody, this narrative. But at the end of the day, you see how lopsided it is on some of the promotions. It's about time we revisit that conversation. We had that conversation about two years ago. And I think it's time to revisit it because when people turn around and say, oh, this person deserves respect, this person deserves respect, this, uh, you know, um, they've been feeding a narrative. Just try to keep the noise as low as possible. So a lot of places will not bring it up because then they're forced to drag in AEW. And you see what goes on with AEW. Look what happened this week with the Warner Media Discovery upfronts. Um, this was, wasn't this last year? Wasn't this last year? This is at the Warner Media upfronts. Obviously, Discovery was not a part of it yet. He had the Young Bucks, Hangman Page, Britt Baker, um, Tony Khan, obviously, Kenny Omega, uh, Randy Rhodes, Cody Rhodes. This year, nothing, nothing. And I love the excuse out there. Well, it happened on a Wednesday and they taped dynamite on a Wednesday. People understand what the upfronts are. Just a little tidbit. And I got this from a website, a business website that explains it very, very blunt and very easy. The upfronts are a period of two to three months when every major TV and streaming company showcases the best in their portfolio in an effort to pitch advertisers on why they should invest significant sums of money in the company's programming. When WWE brought up 18 to 49, you had all these geniuses online that are obsessed with demos. You could go Google it and see for yourself. Last week, they were all on social media going, aha, aha. Eh, demos don't care. Ha -ha. Look at WWE. The first words out of their mouth. Yeah. What I've been saying since 1997. The demos should only be the concern of the comp wrestling companies, the networks, and the advertisers. Period. That's why it's only discussed within WWE amongst the networks, the advertisers. So, of course, it's going to be brought up there. But this year, this year, Dave Meltzer is, was the head of this. And look, it's not his fault. It's not his fault because he has fed certain information. And you saw over the last seven days, all of these shows, and all of these sites that report AEW based on emotion and personal wants and hopes instead of facts, because it went from AEW's presence at the Warner Media Discovery uh, upfronts was going to be huge. It was going to be huge. Then it went to big. Then it went to not so big. Then it went to non-existent. They, could, they didn't even bring Kenny Omega there. He's not on TV right now. They could have taken one or two people off TV and sent them there. Do you realize how important, even if AEW was not going to be represented anywhere near other than a pre-recorded portfolio, you still send representatives there 
you still make a presence, you still shake hands. You got Discovery, which just merged with Warner Media. You show up, you over impress. You don't just, oh, we, we have a dynamite taping to do. Eh, no, we, 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 no. They don't show up. I mean, even if they were slighted, even if they weren't part, what, you have to be gushed with a, uh, all this attention in order to show? That was a huge mistake on their part, a massive mistake on their part. Now, I'm not going to be one of those that's going to spell doom and gloom for AEW on a, on a Warner Media Networks. I'm not doing that because that's ridiculous. Of course, they could drop wrestling anytime they want. They could drop regular TV shows anytime they want. I'm not predicting that right now for AEW. I think they're fine. But my God, the upfronts are so important. And just because you find out that we're not going to have that much of a presence there, a live presence there, no, we won't really send anybody. Oh, my God. What a stupid, stupid, stupid mistake on their part. Stupid. I don't know if this is stupid also, but if you want to go check it out, Go to my Twitter at Don Tony D. I have a poll up right now. Title belt or a trophy? What should the winners of the Owen Hart Foundation tournament receive? Should they get an Owen Hart trophy or should they get a title belt? I have this poll up for a few hours now, and 81% of the voting says that they should get a trophy. Um, there's some reports going around that Tony Khan is going to present the winners with a title belt, a pink one for the women and a black one for the men. I think, I guess the pink and black, which really was red heart, you know, I, I, that's what I heard. I don't know if it's true, but I think that's probably something that if I was Tony Khan, you know, you hear about, Oh, I, Listen to the fans. Hey, Tony, how's about asking fans? How's about putting polls up? Instead of just searching social media and assuming that this fan has the best intentions or maybe this fan is a bot. Never furnish the bots. Now, another thing, he applied for a trademark for another Ring of Honor logo. Very smart. Remember what I said a couple of weeks ago? If I was Tony Khan, you trademark the logos first, then you ask the fans. Because the reason why you do that is if you show the logos first and somebody is in the business and absolutely loves that font or design, they could go ahead and trademark their own before Tony gets to do it. So, you know, this is obviously smart on his part. This was the logo that we talked about a few weeks ago. And the new logo is this. Now, again, they're black and white because that's how they're presented on the trademark website. It doesn't mean that they're going to be black and white. I'm sure there's going to be colors and some designs to it. That is the second logo. I expect Tony Khan to trademark at least one or two more logos, and then he'll probably ask the fans to vote on what his favorite logos are. Now, you know, I've always said to you all that I would never plug a product or any item on these shows unless not only do I recommend it, but I use it for myself. And tonight, this episode is brought to you by Manscaped. Later on in the show, I'm going to give you two package recommendations that your package will thank you for. I kid you not. And remember, Father's Day is coming up. What a perfect Father's Day gift. I am not only an advertiser. I'm a client. I have it on silent mode right now. Yeah, you could shave your nuts. <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit later. I tell you, fabulous, fabulous stuff, man. Heck, I even got the shirt on for tonight. All right.
Before we get into some Q&A, let's just talk briefly about yesterday's shows. Um, I did not watch Dynamite live yesterday. I went to sleep early, got up early this morning. I said, ah, let me catch a little bit of Dynamite before I go to work. And I said, you know, let me go on social media first and see what the overall pulse is. And right away, you got all the bot sites that come up. And I see that, uh, <laughs> by the way, nobody, nobody got the contest right from earlier this week. We were giving away, a, oh, that's too small. That's better. We were giving away an AEW autographed Sting pitcher and a $50 AEW gift card. All you had to do is predict who the Jokers were going to be on Wednesday, the men and the women. Nobody, unfortunately, won. So we'll probably, in fact, we will do the giveaway tomorrow during the Rampage watch party. Um, now, does anybody know the start time? I had a few people tell me 7 p.m. Eastern. So can you confirm that if you don't mind? So we'll do that giveaway tomorrow. We'll do another ratings contest. And then tomorrow, I'll also announce the winner of the ratings contest from the NXT watch party. Dream 101 says the 6 a.m. start time. <laughs> 6 a.m. my ass. All right, thank you, TLD. 7 p.m. All right, so 7 p.m. will be the watch party tomorrow. Uh, so Johnny Impact, a.k.a. Johnny Nitro, a.k.a. John Morrison, a.k.a. John whatever you want to call it, he was the joker on the men's side. He is not signed to any contract. This was a one-shot deal. He would love to come back. And honestly, after I watched that match yesterday, I don't know if it's Samoa Joe's fault. I don't know if it's his fault. But I kind of put the blame on him a little bit more because you're on national TV. You're not on an indie show. He's standing at the top rope. And he wants to do a, do a dive outside the ring onto Samoa Joe. I know everybody's talking about the 450 splash that was botched. But if you go back and you watch it, when Samoa Joe was outside the ring, Johnny Impact, John Morrison, climbs the top rope. And he's going to do one of his crazy flips onto Samoa Joe. Well, Samoa Joe is at fault because he's not in the right position to take the move. And you look at the camera. And you see Johnny Impact going with his hands. Joe, over here, over here. Like twice, three times he did it. And then Joe's waiting there to be caught. He gets in position and he does the move. That's fucking awful. That is fucking awful. Then you get the 450 because Joe has not been in the ring all that much. And he's not in position again. He's too far in the middle of the ring. He thinks that Johnny Impact is going to do a flying elbow drop and he could fly as far as he wants. No, he wants to do a 450. You know, I mean, he thinks he's RVD or something, Samoa Joe. So what happens? Joe is too far in the middle of the ring. Johnny Impact, just excuse me, Johnny, uh, no, Johnny Elite. Did I say Johnny Impact? Yeah, it's not. Johnny Elite. Johnny Elite. He goes for the 450 and he lands on his knees about a foot short of Samoa Joe. And the, the match was a mess. I go and I check out the other Joker. Guys, gals, nothing, nothing says Owen Hart tournament like Brick Baker with a middle finger on the screen and Maki Ito doing all her shenanigans. Do I have any problem with Maki Ito on AEW television? Absolutely not. The fuck is she doing in this Owen Hart tournament? Yo, know, people want to have a little emotion. They want to have some people in this tournament to feel a little connection. Some people thought, oh, maybe they could bring in, uh, you know, Davy Boy Smith Jr. Or they could bring in this person. Oh, this person has a little connection with the Owen Hart, this and that. The fuck you put Maki Ito in the Owen Hart tournament for? Seriously? I mean, nothing says Owen Hart tournament like this picture. You see the headbutt she does? She just falls sideways. She lands on Britt Baker's tummy. and Britt Baker sells it that she got hit in the face. 
I could go on and on and on for yesterday. Yesterday overall was a fun. What about the super kick to Sting? What about the super kick to Sting? I mean, he probably has like a, a, where you get the tetanus shot or whatever when you kid the little shot, you know, in the, they super kicked, I think like the back of his shoulders. Then Adam Cole with a double clothesline to the Hardys. And the funny thing about it was Adam Cole, because he's shorter than people realize, it looked like he was on his tippy toes given the clotheslines. Now, again, the show overall was a fun show. I watched it all today. Takashita is an excellent performer. I personally think they should be featuring some wrestlers from New Japan similar to what Bischoff did in 1995 with the Mexicans, with Rey Mysterio and Psicosis and Juventud and La Parca and others. They would open up Nitro. But I almost feel like Tony Khan wouldn't do that because he doesn't want anybody to compare what he does to what Bischoff did. And we know the heat lately with Bischoff and CM Punk showcased him early on. You know, he did a great match yesterday. But honestly, there's no reason for me to want to watch Takashita. Yeah, he's a great wrestler. There's a million great wrestlers out there. I have to be emotionally invested in these people. So he has a great match. But you have a fun show, and it gets overshadowed by so much, uh, you know, missed spots. I mean, look, as much as we criticize WWE storylines, you know, and the creative, you know, either, either they just absolutely will not tolerate shit like this, or their camera work is unreal. I don't know if it's necessarily the camera work on the AEW side. But I watch some of the dark stuff that they have. I mean, it comes off as laziness on Tony Khan's part. I mean, you see some of those botches on dark. Um, How do you not? Are you afraid to hurt anybody's feelings? Oh, this person came in. Oh, oh, he did a tope suicida and his legs got caught in the ropes. He almost went straight down like a rocket ship that, that oh, might hurt his feelings. Oh, but she's so cute. They're fucking lazy. That's embarrassing. It looks Bush League. It diminishes what AEW is. I watched that yesterday and I'm like, man, you know, this is not the elite of the elite. And that's what it should be. And to see, you know, Johnny Elite going like this to Samoa Joe, I'm like, the guy knows he's on nationwide TV. Does he just not give a fuck? Because I honestly believe if that was WWE programming, Johnny Elite would have probably climbed down off the top rope and probably hit Samoa Joe with a different move or improvise, get Joe in place, and then climb the rope and do it again. Are these guys too pressed for time? Are they too pressed for time? Because what Tony Khan's biggest problem is right now with AEW Dynamite, he's trying to shove three pounds of bologna in a one-pound bag. He's, got, he's going back to the days where he's got to have 60 people on the show. 60. Jeff Hardy versus Adam Cole went like six minutes, and it was a commercial break with about five minutes left in the show. I'm like, what the fuck is this? All right. I mean, Serena Deeb, you know, all right. Yeah, everybody's talking about, how, oh, you know, well, grumpy men did this, and this is Senato. I had to, to, to get my tits bigger in this. Uh, we don't need this shit on diet. No, but we got to put a woman on. Oh, God. I watched people, like some people were absolutely destroying the show and people actually like praising every fucking little thing yesterday. And it's, I'm telling you, man, it hurts them. I thought the show overall was fun, but those little things should not be tolerated. And it just seems like nobody gives a fuck. I honestly 
be honest, guys and gals, John Morrison, Johnny Impact, Johnny Elite, John Hennigan, Johnny whatever. When did you ever see him on nationwide TV doing a high spot and going like this? Joe, over here. I don't know, man. But the rating yesterday, a little better, a little better. 920, not Joey, not 924, but 922. 10% increase. Good. Good. You know what's great about that rating? Yesterday was the NBA playoffs. They killed it in the ratings. Well, well, the ratings are not supposed to be good during NBA. See what happened yesterday? Your fans, 100,000 of them chose to watch AEW over the NBA. There was nothing different. Let me show you a tale of what I talk about, the AEW coverage versus NXT. AEW goes up 10% in the ratings, and everybody praises it, and nobody brings up basketball because you're not supposed to have a, uh, an average, you know, that's pretty much the average. You're not supposed to have a rating like that during NBA. We have to blame NBA for shitty ratings. Why The games yesterday, why, why wouldn't people tune in? NXT, 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 Tuesday, did 601,000 viewers. It's about average of what they've been doing. They've been averaging about 610, about that. 14% increase from the week before. You know, decent number. You go around and you look at a lot of these news sites, and you know what they actually had the balls and the disrespect to write? I don't understand why this week's show did such a better rating than last week. News reporters actually wrote that. I don't know why this week's show did such a good rating compared to last week. Just fucking report the news. The reason why it did a better rating is because fans of NXT wanted to watch last night's show, more than uh, Tuesday show, more than they wanted to watch basketball. That's all it is. Basketball never blames re re wrestling. TV shows never blame wrestling when their numbers suck. They don't blame other shows. They blame themselves. Wrestling goofs are the only nerds out there that make an excuse for why a wrestling fan chooses not to watch wrestling when it airs live in prime time. You think this Warner Media Discovery deal? You think this, what they were doing this week? You think that's for replay? You think that's for YouTube? You think that's for other things? No, that's for advertisers. Advertisers want, want their, sh their advertising prime time. And a replay. Replays are much cheaper because there's far less people tuning in. But you see that disrespect to NXT? People actually, uh, I don't know why the rating went up this week. The fuck up. Seriously. All right, so your jokers. Oh, little piece of advice, everyone. Did you see the post that Champa wrote on Instagram? Is it nine o'clock yet? Uh, ten o'clock. We got twenty-five minutes, so we'll cover some news to the ten o'clock hour. We'll take a two-minute break so I could hook up Kev Castle's audio. I'm going to record his show tonight. We'll come back here. We'll do Q and A for the rest of the show, and we'll be good. Um. Champa posted something cute on Instagram yesterday. And I felt bad for some fans yesterday because when Johnny went on the screen, <laughs> John Gargano! <laughs> no, it wasn't Johnny Gargano. It was Johnny Elite. Champa posted this. Hanging out at Epcot with a couple of jokers. And it's a picture of Johnny Gargano and Candice LeRae. Very cute. Very cute. Everybody saw that. Oh, jokers. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Johnny Gargano, Candice LeRae, they're going to they be the jokers. Oh, could they be? Could they be? Here's a little piece of advice, everyone. I'm sure most of you have figured this out already. And I think the others have figured it out, too. I think they just do it for clickbait more than anything else. Whenever a wrestler, right before someone debuts or a surprise happens, and a wrestler teases 
that they are going to appear or someone else is going to appear, that is the telltale sign. They're not going to appear. Wrestlers have been doing that for years and years and years. The problem is sometimes it gets so blown out of control that some wrestlers feel guilty. That's why when AEW was teasing their surprise in Cleveland, and it wasn't Gargano not too long ago, Johnny Gargano went on social media and felt bad. He's like, look, everybody, I apologize that I wasn't there, but you will see me back in wrestling soon. He didn't have to do that. The guy is uber classy. But whenever wrestlers throw a tease right before a surprise, a pay-per-view, something, 99.99% of the time, you could X those people out as possibilities. It never happens that way. Never happens that way. But I still thought it was a cute picture. Very cute picture. Uh, I'm very, very happy for the Garganos. They're doing really, really well. You know, I don't want to get into this tonight because we got to get more information together. I will get all the facts. I will get the complete story. And we will talk about whatever we find on Saturday. But for those that aren't aware, Stephanie McMahon is taking a hiatus from WWE. Um, she wrote on Twitter tonight, as of tomorrow, I am taking a leave of absence from the majority of my responsibilities at WWE. WWE is a lifelong legacy for me, and I look forward to returning to the company that I love after taking this time to focus on my family. Now, I'm not going to go into this now, but I will say this. Nick Khan, because the business wire has already picked up on this. Very important what I'm about to say. The business world already picked up on this. And they already are reporting that Nick Khan will take a lot of Stephanie's responsibilities for now. As far as what is going on in her family, I'm not speculating. That's disrespectful. Whatever I could find out that I could talk about, we'll talk about Saturday. But I will say this. What you saw happen tonight in the business world with Stephanie is exactly what I was telling you, which was the opposite of what happened with Triple H. You had every website that, that pushed that narrative, that WWE was forcing Triple H out. They were taking away. They were raising his legacy. They were removing him from here, and they're taking on his team. They're doing this, doing this, doing this. And if someone was being removed of their duties, you know, for any particular reason, they will alert the business world, and the business world will report it accordingly. Now, Triple H obviously had the heart issues, and that's what was reported. But the business world never reported that WWE was taking away Triple H's his position, his power, his this, his that, his this. They never did that. If the business world doesn't do it, then don't listen to any of these podcasters or websites that tell you otherwise. The perfect example of it was Saudi Arabia that time. When they were on the tarmac and they could not get home, and sure, families of the wrestlers that were stranded there, they were very concerned and they were worried and thinking of the worst because of Saudi Arabia and its history. But you had all these websites claiming that they were being held against their will and something about Vince and holding up this. And I said, where is CNN reporting it? Where is Fox News, MSNBC, ABC, and whatever you want to call it? You don't think a bunch of Americans being forcibly detained in Saudi Arabia is not a story that any of these shows are going to pick up on? None of them reported it. But, you know, WrestlingHick.com reports all this crazy shit, and it ended up not being true. Johnny Rampage. I tell you, I like the name Johnny Rampage. Would he be? Well, he's not signed. He's not signed. So, yes, I am a little having a little bit of coffee tonight. I slept good yesterday. I need a good night's sleep. All right. Yesterday on AEW for your, for the Owen Hart tournament quarterfinals, Samoa Joe beating Johnny Elite. We had Kyle O'Reilly beating 
Ray Phoenix, Dr. Britt Baker beating Maki Ito, and Adam Cole defeating Jeff Hardy. So as it is right now, we have Kyle O'Reilly facing Samoa Joe in the semifinal. You already have Adam Cole going to the final. Adam Cole's been my pick to win it. A lot of people want to see Kyle O'Reilly versus Adam Cole. And I'll be honest with you. I actually, if you ask me, which would I rather have, Samoa Joe versus Adam Cole or Kyle O'Reilly versus Adam Cole? I would like to see Kyle O'Reilly versus Adam Cole. You know, I know we saw that feud in NXT. I mean, you remember the wars that they had. Remember they were on the stretchers and they brawled? I mean, I think a lot of people forgot how awesome that feud was in NXT. So if if they give us Kyle O'Reilly versus Adam Cole at double or nothing, yeah, yeah. I won't go as far as say, take my money. No, you know, one match is not going to make me pay that kind of money. But that is definitely part of it. And, you know, I'm going to say one other thing about Tony Khan with a big problem with AEW, too. But first, let's look on the women's side. So now we have Tony Storm taking on Britt Baker next week. Winner of that match will go to the finals. And then on the opposite side, we have Ruby Soho taking on the winner of Red Velvet and Chris Statlander. That happens tomorrow at Rampage. I'm not giving away spoilers. So the winner of that match will go on as well to take on Ruby Soho. So that is the update there. I have Ruby Soho winning the whole thing as well. By the way, um, other matches from yesterday, Hangman Page over Kanesuke Takashita. Uh, Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland over J.D. Drake and Anthony Henry. MJF gave Wardlow 10 uh, lashes. And on Rampage Friday, we have Malachi Black, Buddy Matthews, and Brody King versus 10, Evil Uno, and Fuego Del Sol. Sean Spears over Big Damo, who was killing Dane in WWE. We have Chris Statlander versus Red Velvet for the Owen Hart Foundation Tournament quarterfinal. We have uh, Brian Danielson and John Moxley versus Dante Martin and Matt Seidel. Uh, now, yesterday we had confrontations with William Regal, um, the Blackpool Combat Club, Jericho Appreciation Society, Eddie Kingston, um, this is going to lead to a five-on-five five match at Double or Nothing. You know, we were all thinking blood and guts, blood and guts, blood and, blood and guts, but I don't think it's actually going to end up being blood. I think a lot of us want blood and guts, just so William Regal could say it. Blood and guts. But it's not going to be blood and guts. But they will announce something soon, obviously. I tell you, Double or Nothing is uh, shaping up to be a, a really, you know, can't-miss pay-per-view. We'll get into the card on Monday because obviously there's some ramifications going down on Rampage that I don't want to get into right now. But, uh, you know, to, to see Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland put in a tag title match, part of a three-way, you know, for uh, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy's tag titles, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool to see. But like I said, we'll get into it on Monday. Um, all right. NXT. On Tuesday, we had, oh, my God. I, You know what? I got something with Joe Gacy that made me laugh my ass off. I, we'll get into it in a moment. I have a picture I got to share with you. Cameron Grimes and Solo Sokoa over Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams. Last legend over Tatum Paxley to advance the breakout tournament. I was hoping Tatum Paxley would go a little bit further, but, uh, you know, she lost. Last legend getting a little better, but still a long ways away. Joe Gacy issues a challenge to Braun Breaker. They will be fighting it in your house, which is the first Saturday in June. We have some NXT tour news in a few minutes. The Viking Bra Vader Raiders over the Creed Brothers. I don't know what the fuck Brutus was thinking. Did you see? He did like a cannonball outside the ring. I don't ever wish injury on anyone, but he should have broke his kneecaps. Who the fuck does that? We talked about it on the Patreon show Tuesday night. You know, the big problem, you know why a lot of these botches happen with the younger stars? 
And you see it in NXT too. And yes, NXT is developmental, but still, you, you should not be making those kind of mistakes. The problem I see that happens on AEW Dark, more than anywhere, you see it on Elevation a little bit, sometimes it leaks out into Dynamite, which is unacceptable. You've seen it with, you know, a lot of dive moves. And you saw it even with the Cree brothers is, especially when you're a bigger guy, you should be able to get by showcasing your power. And what the problem with a lot of these guys are is they think they could get over quicker with the fans by adding a little spin to their power moves, to add a little spin. And the problem is when you add a spin, your own little spin to a power move, there's a reason why nobody does a fucking cannonball out to outside the ring. You, you land the wrong way, you break your knees. Your legs are not supposed to land that way. I don't care what knee pads you have. So these guys, instead of doing spots that are known, oh, no, I got to tweak it a little bit. I got to reverse this. I got to do this upside down. I got to put my leg like here. I got to make it look like I'm spread eagle. And that's where either they get injured or they don't get injured, and it looks like shit. So they end up winning the Viking Raiders. Grayson Waller over Andre Chase. Roxanne Perez over Kiana James to advance. Roxanne Perez is still my pick to win it. Nathan Frazier and Wesley go to a no contest because of Von Wagner showing up and basically destroying mostly Wesley, throwing him across the announcer's table. And Santos Escobar beating Tony D'Angelo. We were laughing in the watch party when Tony D'Angelo was going for his crowbar. You know, me, I get little animated in the watch parties. I'm like, it can't be there. They, Legado del Vantage, they had to have stole it. No, 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 cannot be there. And sure enough, oh, you're looking for this? I loved it. I loved it. We're always one step ahead of that. So that was, that was good. But I laughed my ass off with Joe Gacy. The Druid thing is goofy. They haven't revealed who the Druids are yet, and they need to. Because um, you keep showcasing them on TV, the curiosity factor gets bigger, bigger, bigger. And the longer you wait, the more or the bigger the name it's got to be. I still am going with the possibility that it's the grizzled young veterans, maybe repackaged. They're obviously white. I mean, let's be honest, you see the fingers. But they still haven't revealed them yet. We were joking Tuesday, like, hey, you really want to surprise us? Let it be Rick and Scott Steiner. But with all the arthritis from their wrestling over the years, their fingers are not perfect. You know, their middle finger, they, they, they almost look like Vulcan fingers, like Mr. Spock. Like one is going like this. Like you could probably like, you know, go for life and it actually, anyway. Um, so the challenge to face Braun Breaker at In Your House, I'm fine with that. What they did early in the night was good. But they close out NXT. I don't know how you felt about it. They close out NXT with Joe Gacy cutting another promo with the Druids. And I like Joe Gacy. I love his character. It, I like how methodical it is. And, you know, they have a close-up of him. And I'm good. I'm good. Like, yeah, this is good. Until they did the far shot. And if you didn't watch the end of NXT, you have to watch. It's on YouTube. Just look up Joe Gacy NXT and do a search like the last 24 hours. I think WWE posted the video yesterday. When they did the far shot of him laughing, I, I took a screenshot of it. He wasn't in a graveyard. He wasn't in a dark alley. The motherfucker was standing on top of a roof top lounge restaurant. How moronic and stupid is that? This guy is a maniacal, evil person, and he's laughing, and they have a drone going further and further back, and they're showing him. I'm like, what did he do? Get a fucking Apple Martini or a Shirley Temple afterwards? He's on the top. That's a rooftop. Anybody ever go to a rooftop lounge bar restaurant? You go to nice warm weather, the top of the hotel, 
all the way at the top. They have a bar and a restaurant. You could see the scenery, take in the air. You dance a little bit. You pick up. You might get a little bit of knob action in the corner if nobody's looking. This motherfucker is standing on top of a rooftop bar and, and lounge. What did you have, chicken fingers after? I looked at that. I'm like, who the fuck thought of that? Go to a graveyard. Light a fucking garbage can on fire. I know they did that with the ring. The ring! A rooftop? Joe Gacy? Oh, man, that was like the ultimate. Yes, noob, random. I, I started laughing. I went from loving the promo to laughing. Man, what the fuck are you on a rooftop lounge for? You know, let me get the skirt steak. And he oozed the wars. Give me some more derbs. He's supposed to be an evil, crazy motherfucker. Not a rich bitch. Oh, man, that was awful. That was so awful. But as we said, rating went back up 601, right about what their average is. And uh, next week, they have Braun Breaker versus Duke Hudson in a non-title match. We got Mandy Rose versus Indy Hartwell in a non-title match. Idris and Ophi and Malik Blade versus Stax and Two Dimes. That's... Uh, Tony D'Angelo's group. One of them without the hat. He looks like somebody that works in Dunkin' Donuts. Dressed up for Halloween. Hey, hey, how you doing? Do I look like I'm on Sopranos? Hey, hey. Goof. Pretty Deadly versus Roderick Strong and Damon Kemp in a non-title match. Alba Fire versus Electra Lopez and Sanga versus Wesley. Sanga made me laugh. If you didn't see it, He's sitting at some type of a bar. He's got the, he was, it was probably the rooftop lounge. He was sitting there. He's nice and dressed. He's got the gold chain, the gold watch, the nice rings. He's got a drink. He's almost doing the good fellas, you know, with the pinky. And he says a couple of things to Wesley. And uh, I don't remember the other guy's name. And uh, other guy walks off and Wesley and him, like, you know, talking a little bit. And Wesley is kind of like, you know, challenging him he's like my friend it doesn't have to be this way but if you insist i'd be more than happy and i'm like this is funny because when you go it it, it made me feel like when you're talking to customer service especially when they outsource to india and i'm not saying this in any racist way but if you ever talk to customer service for a cell phone company flowers whatever you want and it's outsourced to India. And you're like, look, I ordered these roses and I got dandelions. Well, sir, I'm very, very sorry. Could you give me, please, you do, just bear with me for one minute. Let me go check. I will be right back. Please give me a moment. Just wait a moment. That's what it looked like. Sangha, that guy, as big as he is, I would have got up and squashed the drink. This is going to be your head. You sure you want this? My brother, it doesn't need to be this way. Oh, man. That was awful, too. Sangha should be, it, like, scaring people. Guys, fingers, just grab the drink and smash it. You know, break the glass. Use a, a sugar glass if you have to. No, he's very polite. My friend, I'm very sorry. You don't need to be this way. But if you must insist, and we must batter it out in the ring, then we will. Be like, you stupid motherfucker. I'll squash you like a grape. I'll feed you to my pet. Okay. Um, in five minutes, I'm going to go take a three-minute break, hook up Kev Castle's audio because I'm recording his show tonight. We'll come back here, do Q&A, talk about a few other things, and call it a night. Uh, NXT is going to be touring certain areas of Florida. It's going to be every two weeks. And this is what we've been wanting for a while. You can't have your last legends and your newbies, the ones that are brand new that haven't even been in the ring all that much. They need to work and not just TV. So now, Friday, June 10th, they're going to be in Tampa, Florida. July 11th at the Largo Event Center in Largo, Florida. Friday, June 24th at Jacksonville Armory in Jacksonville. Saturday, June 25th at the Venice Community Center in Venice, Florida. 
July 8th, Friday, at the Citrus Springs Community Center in Dunalong? Dunalong? July 9th, in the Englewood Neighborhood Center in Orlando. Friday, July 22nd, at the Melbourne Auditorium in Melbourne, Florida. And Saturday, July 23rd, at the Coco, Coco Armory in Coco, Florida. That is really, really important. You're going to see, if anybody goes to those shows, you're going to see probably many of the very inexperienced wrestlers that need to work. You perform in front of 500 fans. You get some practice. You do it in front of a live crowd. And they're finally doing this. They haven't done this for two years. We used to talk about Omas. Omas, you know, you never saw him really on NXT TV, you know, before he showed up on WWE television. And he was doing a lot of house shows for NXT. And up until that time, I had people saying to me like, NXT does house shows? This was before COVID or right as COVID started. So this is very, very important for some names there. So good, good. I'm glad that they're finally doing that. So we still have three minutes. I have to be precise at the 10 o'clock hour because that's when he's doing his show. If I set up now, then I have to stand there and wait for two, three minutes. So, all right, I will be taking a break in two or three minutes. Um, let me see. Uh, quick comment that came in. This is from DHV Smoking Trees. Thank you for the super chat. My friend, the own our tournament should have been 16 man. It felt very underwhelming. I'll tell you this much. The men's side looks pretty damn good. I just personally, I'm, I, I agree with you. I think instead of having all the qualifying matches that they did, they should have just had a 16-man tournament. Um, I think the reason why they did it that way is because, um, you know, they didn't want some of the matches to be as competitive as, you know what I mean? Because you remember, look at some of the opponents, especially on the women's side. You had names that, you know, some people had never heard of before. Like, and why are they in the Owen Hart Foundation tournament qualifier? They didn't want to use, you know, top names. So that's why they didn't do that. Um, I personally agree with you. If it would have been 16 men and you could definitely fill eight other names, you could have put Jungle Boy in there. Well, no, you could, I think he was in a qualifying match, but you didn't even have Danielson in there. You didn't have Moxley. They didn't want him to lose, obviously. They could have had two people in there and let it be a double disqualification. Yes, you could do that once in a while, Tony. Nobody's going to get mad at you. But I agree with you 100%. I would have liked to have seen a 16-person tournament, especially on the women's side. Because the women's side, like I said, after all of this, again, nothing against Maki Ito, but she in the Owen Hart Foundation tournament, I mean, you know, put her on TV. Put her in regular match as a surprise. You could do that, but to put her in that Owen Hart Foundation tournament, I don't know. I just thought that was just so random, and especially the way they hyped it up. You know, Tony has hyped up these surprises, and yes, we mentioned the other day that jokers don't necessarily have to be, um, you know, people who are haven't been signed. I made mention of that on Monday, and Maki Ito obviously has been there before. But what is she going to do? She's going to stay in the States for a week or two and then go back and then that's it. All right. Um, let me go take a three-minute break and then I will be back here and then we will get into a whole bunch of Q&A. So uh, just uh, go take a break and I will see you back here in three minutes. <laughs>
I'm not even going to wait the minute. He's not even uh, ready to do his show because he's listening to, to uh, I think, Wrestling Soup's still doing their show. I'm not going to sit there and, you know, wait extra minutes here because I wanted to do an audio check. That was the whole reason of doing a 10 o'clock hour, you know, do an audio check, make sure the levels are fine, but they're not even connected. So I just hit record and however the audio quality is, you know, it is. So <clears throat> try to be nice. You do stuff and uh, yeah, but, but of course I'll be blamed for something. You know that. Okay. Okay. I don't, I don't care what time stuff ends, Kevin Milwaukee, you know, I, I I'm not stopping my show just to do stuff like that. And then people aren't around. So it's all right. But thank you for sticking around. So let's get into some Q and a, and we obviously still have to plug some very cool merch in a little bit. Um, let me remind everyone that next week is three years of AEW. And, um, you know, it's been three great years Makes you ask yourself, makes you ask yourself. And I didn't forget about talking about a little bit more with Sasha Banks and Naomi and Charlotte. We will definitely get into that in a few moments. But um, makes you wonder, if AEW never started three years ago, what would our conversations be like? Do you think Impact Wrestling would be bigger than what it is right now? Do you think NWA would have gotten a little bit bigger than what it is right now? makes you think about like what would have been you know plus makes you also wonder you know, like where would a lot of these wrestlers be performing right now would ring of honor have been sold makes you think and i'm sure we'll have that conversation next week so uh all right you know on saturday when we talk about the big problem with AEW as well you know I I think one of the biggest problems they have is, you know, you obviously, when you have Raw, when you have SmackDown, you have some big names that you showcase. On SmackDown, obviously, Roman Reigns. You know, on Raw, it's Cody, Seth Rollins, uh, Randy Orton. You know, those are the bigger names. But you also have to fill in time with others. And the problem that Tony Khan falls into and it was so glaring yesterday is Jeff Hardy and Adam Cole is like if you're presenting a big catering or if you're having a meal you know you don't want everybody to fill up on appetizers you know because you spend a lot of time and money preparing like a, a beautiful filet mignon or you know beautiful steak or pot pot roast tur like a main dish and then what happens is you stuff everybody with lots of hors d'oeuvres by the time you want to really show them like what you put all your hard work and money into and then everybody's like oh i'm stuffed off oh, i that's what happens that's what happens this guy feels like he's got to put 70 people on a show and unfortunately, not everybody can get the opportunity to be on prime time. You know, with all due respect, I liked seeing Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland yesterday. But was that match really necessary? Was it really necessary? You take that away, the Serena Deeb stuff, with all due respect, I would have put that on Friday. You know, I, I, I'm baffled at some of the decisions. But all right. so. As we always do on Thursdays, our channel members get a little bit of VIP treatment when it comes to asking questions. Everyone obviously can. Just put the in capital letters, the word question before your question so I could spot it a little bit quicker. And if you're enjoying tonight's show, you know, smash that like button. It helps. It helps very much. Um, by the way, you know, the Dan... The Brian Danielson incident that happens on Rampage, I don't want to talk about it yet you know, because it obviously hasn't aired on TV yet. I don't even know if that is going to air on TV yet. I mean, I'm not giving anything away, but 
I will say that, you know, a lot of people are saying that it was real. A lot of people are saying it was storyline. You know, I see some of you asking about that. You know, I don't really have that answer right now. So, all right. Near, do I think WWE will do an event in Japan in the next year? I'm not so sure. You know, we talked about it last week with Hikaru Shida. You know, when AEW made that announcement, I immediately said it's transportation related because COVID restrictions are very, very tough in Japan. And the travel is awful in the United States right now. And there's a lot of flight cancellations. There's a lot of, uh, you know, extra expense. And that is an awful lot of money to invest to go overseas, plan an event like that, and God forbid it gets canceled because of additional COVID restrictions. And then you hear about, you know, people having to quarantine for a certain amount of time. I personally, I do not see WWE going to Japan this year. Next year, possible, very possible. But this year, I say no. I, there's so much going on for the rest of the year, especially you realize now Money in a Bank is going to be a stadium show. Your SummerSlam is now, you know, almost, a, I don't want to say as big as WrestleMania, but, you know, it's a huge event. And then next thing you know, you're almost, you know, towards Survivor Series. Not this year. Not this year. Uh, I don't have a registry, Eric. I don't know if I'm going to have a registry. You know, it's... It's not that we have everything we need already, but we really haven't, you know, like, I don't know what we put on it. I, I have another wedding I got to go to very soon. And I looked at their registry and basically the registry was for everyone to pay for their uh, honeymoon. Oh, give money for a tour here. Give money for this, for a dinner, for this. I'm like, no, I'll give you a set of forks and you shut the fuck up. You know, by the way, totally unrelated. Do you know... On Monday's show, I got an age restriction from YouTube. First time I've ever gotten an age restriction. And I asked them why. And they were very, look, you're nice and respectful. You get a nice and respectful answer back. I asked why. And they came back to me and they said, you know, the footage I showed of the old men beating, beating each other up. And I said, that's comedy. I said, they were just falling over all over the place. They said, yeah, but that's a real fight. And they don't condone that. So they actually put an age restriction because of the fight that I showed of those old men pretending to be Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat, believe it or not. By the way, we were right. We were right about Ricky Steamboat. We talked about it on Patreon Tuesday. Ricky Steamboat is not going to have this match with Ric Flair. And a lot of people were asking Tuesday why. And I said, my only answer can be is that Ricky Steamboat wants all his fans to remember him for the feud with Chris Jericho. That at 69 years old, if he looks bad, if Rick looks bad, God forbid something happens health-wise to one or both of them, then his the last memory you have of Ricky Steamboat is this disaster. And it's too much of a risk. And there is apparently a lot of dissension right now with Conrad Thompson and Ricky Steamboat. I'm trying to get all the, the juicy details. You know, I like Conrad, so I'm not going to throw any shade his way. But I'm going to find out what the deal is, what the deal is. Um, Harris B., happy 14-month anniversary, my friend. Worst theme song ever. Uh, for him, it's Right to Censor. I loved Right to Censor. I loved it because anything that you were supposed to enjoy, you were supposed to censor it. Um, wow. Worst theme song? Guys, gals, what's some of your worst theme songs? Um, I'm trying to think. Worst theme songs. There's a real, uh, man, I can't think of any off hand. Heidenreich is awful. Heidenreich's was awful. Um, I'm just thinking like Attitude Era. Um, there was, uh, you know, you know, whose song I, I always hated, you know, what song I always hate. I'll give you one. Steve Blackman's first theme, Steve Blackman's first theme. I always almost fell asleep from it. It was so generic and it would have like this guitar solo for a couple of seconds 
And I'm like, oh, please, the pain. That song sucked. When they did the second one, it was just the drum beat. It's like a little bit of like house music, the drum beat, you know? And he would come out and he'd do like the, that was good. Jeff Jarrett's was annoying, but it was okay. Billy and Chuck Smurphy. Billy and Chuck's theme is one of my favorites. You thought you look so beautiful to me. I I I used to love that song. When I used to do the the wrestling uh theme music radio station online, I used to stream wrestling songs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That was one of the most requested songs. We would put in polls like you know, what songs you want? And at that time, a lot of people wanted that song. Yeah. Yeah. You look so good to me. Yep. Yep. Good song. Uh, Dominic Gibson, could I, could I Undertaker Kane or man type, mankind type character? And I, 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 I'm assuming what he's saying is, could we see an Undertaker Kane or mankind type character in AEW? I could see an abyss type character. Um, I always thought if Luchasaurus would ever turn heel, now I don't think they would make like an evil dinosaur mask, but I could see him transforming into something totally different. Um, I think an abyss character could still work. Undertaker, I think, is a little bit outdated. If trust me, if the Undertaker debuted in 2020 instead of ni- 2021 instead of 1991, I think it would have been handled uh, and looked at a whole lot different. You know, it's just the respect factor and the longevity of his career is why we love it so much. But no one would be able to get away with that in this day and age. So, oh, best theme songs are easy, Harris. You go to Demolition. You, you know, you go to Ultimate Warrior. Uh, you know, I mean, there's trillions of great theme songs. I did a theme song anthology one time. I called it Unthology. And most of the songs that were on there were my favorite songs. I think it was four CDs worth of songs. Demolition is probably my favorite one. Favorite one. Pandemic was not a blessing in disguise. Fucked a lot of stuff up. It's still fucking a lot of stuff up. Look at this economy and everything else going on. Let's see. Um, We had a couple of super chats earlier. So let me answer those very quickly. King of Games. Thank you for my honesty about AEW Dynamite. Definitely needed it. I appreciate that. And I'm I'm good to... Saturday talk about the women's stuff. You know, I don't want to talk it's it's something we've talked about before, but it's obviously an issue that is starting to come to the surface because you see Naomi and Sasha Banks. I mean, look, I guess we could talk about this now. You know, I posted a tweet yesterday, and it's ridiculous that at the very end of my tweet, I had to put a disclaimer that I support Sasha and Naomi more than I support WWE on this. And I had to do that because right away, if I don't say that, then people think that I'm automatically throwing shade on Sasha Banks. And even though I put that disclaimer out there, I still got ripped apart from some people. And what I said yesterday is that Sasha Banks is not much different than Charlotte Flair. Sasha Banks is one of the top women in the company. Sasha Banks, if you saw that interview that she did on Broken Skull with Steve Austin, you know, the the days of thank you and cake and this, this and that are long gone, you know, with her, that she's ready for the next level and this and that, and she wants to be treated as such. Um, You look at, you know, what came out as far as, you know, her face and Rhonda and Bianca faces Naomi. And what about the tag titles? This and that, you know, I brought it up on Tuesday on Patreon. What kept spinning in my head was the Bret Hart stuff. When Vince McMahon did that interview, said Bret Hart forgot that this is a business, you know, and these wrestlers are playing characters. They're getting paid a lot of money. 
Sasha Banks is getting paid a lot of money. And, you know, I still support Sasha and Naomi on this because they were promised certain things that WWE probably was in no position to deliver. Let's get Sasha back. Let's get Sasha back. Let's keep Sasha happy. Let's do a little. Naomi's frustrated. The net is frustrated. She's not getting the recognition she deserves. We'll give it a tag titles. We'll do this. We'll do this. We'll do this. And then some of that does not develop. And then you complain. And then you're being told, watch your attitudes. You know, straighten your attitudes out. You know, and you're like, what the fuck? You know, I was told this, this, and this. And look what's happening now. Oh, yeah. but, but, but I also feel that early on in Sasha's career, she had veterans that helped her. And maybe some of those veterans did not want to work with Sasha early on, but they did to, to help the second generation come, to come up or the next generation to come up. I'm sure not everybody wanted to work with Naomi early on, but you do it because it's the right thing to do. Um, what I also said, that guy that's on Twitter, that is friends with Naomi, right? I made it clear that he was genuine in what he was saying, but he made one mistake. He made one mistake. And unfortunately people make this mistake far too often. Instead of just going with facts, they try to add a little more as like a, like a safe, like to be, to add a little safe safety net and it backfired. And I'll tell you what I mean. If you follow WWE's statement, WWE said that Sasha and Naomi refused to work with two of the women. Because, and in the past they worked, and you remember the, the announcement. Now, the only problem I had with this guy's statement was it was put up about an hour after Raw went off the air. I honestly don't believe that Naomi, within that hour, did the meeting, talked to Vince, talked to Johnny Ace, talked to all these people, left the building, and the first thing she did was contact this person to say, oh, you wouldn't believe this, and they said this, and this is, and that, blah, 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 blah. You know, I just can't picture, you know, you tell your husband, but you tell random friends like right after it. I just, it was a little too detailed in just in such a short amount of time, just expressing an opinion. But, but WWE never said Nikki Ash and Dewdrop. Never said that. They said two women could have been Oscar and it could have been Becky Lynch. This guy on Twitter said that Sasha and Naomi never said anything about Dewdrop or Nikki Esh. Whoa, 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 whoa. WWE be never mentioned those two women's names. The reason why that guy put that out there is because that guy was obviously sticking up to Sasha and Naomi. It's his friend. And so I don't blame him. But what he tried to do was try to eliminate anything that anybody could get angry at Sasha and Naomi for. And that one aspect of that press release that WWE said, that is the one thing that a lot of people could have grilled Naomi and Sasha about. Like, why would you refuse to work with these women? You know, they're on the roster just as much as you and everybody comes from somewhere and what is so wrong? So that guy took it upon himself to say, these women never, Naomi and Sasha never said anything, never brought up, you know, disagreements work with Nikki, Ash and Dewdrop. WWE never said them. This guy tried to be proactive to, to try to eliminate before anybody starts and say, why would they turn out? That's where the guy screwed up. That's where he screwed up. But what I said on Twitter is that Sasha Banks is not much different than Charlotte Flair. Charlotte Flair looks out for Charlotte Flair. She has worked her ass off to become one of the top women in pro wrestling. And she feels that there is a certain standard with her character, with her uh, aura about her, with her appearances on TV. Some people say that 
She doesn't really sell for some people and she doesn't put in the effort that others. You look at what is going on here. The demands that Sasha Banks is looking for is really not much different than Charlotte Flair. And imagine if Charlotte Flair walked out on Raw Monday, whether with Naomi or without. Imagine if that was Charlotte Flair that would have done it. Everybody would have called for Charlotte Flair's head. Fire her, unprofessional. That, that is just beyond unacceptable, totally disrespectful, no excuse whatsoever. You get paid to do a job, you do it. Whether you like it or not, you're supposed to help people. But because it's Sasha Banks and she is beloved by wrestling fans, the majority of wrestling fans, we got to support them. We got They deserve better. Yeah, absolutely. Sasha deserves better. Naomi deserves better. Nikki Ash, Doudrop, Thunder Rosa, Serena Deeb, Hikaru Shida. You go down the list, any wrestlers you want to bring up women. Yeah, they all deserve a little bit better. The problem is that they are promised things to keep them happy, satisfied. No, 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 just wait. Look at Bianca. Bianca let it play out. You know, she lost at SummerSlam last year. Oh, my God, WWE's doing it dirty. Just let it play out. Give it some time. It may take seven months, but give it some time. In the end, it'll work. And it did. It did. For some others, it never does get to that point. Not everybody gets that promise kept. And there's a lot of women in wrestling, but they can't complain all that much because there isn't as much opportunity as you think. That's why when Tony Storm makes a couple of complaints or Ember Moon makes a couple of complaints, you know, it stands out so much because you don't see too many women speaking out and really voice, look at Big Swall. Big Swall didn't really say anything absolutely awful, but she saw what was going on and she expressed, you know, and everybody, you know, some people took her side, some people took Tony Khan's. You saw Tony Khan's reaction to it. So, you know, you see on the women's side that they are promised a lot more than what they're given. And when you get to that status as Sasha Banks or Charlotte Flair or anybody else, you know, it's not, you know, just an average, you know, person on the roster that is just, oh, let me wait a little bit more. Let me wait. No, no. She's now doing Hollywood. She knows that she's at the top of a game. She's throwing out first pitches at the Red Sox game. She's on the red carpet. She's doing all this. She's on here. She's this. And now she wants to be treated as the elite. And again, Sasha Banks and Charlotte Flair have a lot more in common than people will admit. And the reason why it's a very unpopular stance to take is because Charlotte Flair is so disliked amongst the IWC and Sasha Banks is so beloved. So how dare anyone claim that Sasha Banks is anything like Charlotte Flair? Ooh. They are very, very much alike. Very much alike. So, yeah, that's my New York accent, Harris. I say big swall. That's how I say it. That's how I talk. So, but uh, I saw this come in earlier from Chris. Thank you for, for this 20 spot, my friend. The Naomi Sasha issue. Have them beat Bianca and Ronda in a tag title match on TV before the pay-per-view. They go in with momentum to the pay-per-view. They can still both lose, and their tag titles are made stronger by the TV win. Problem is, there is absolutely no reason for Ronda Rousey and Bianca Belair to team up, take on Sasha and Bianca. That would be so random, and it's totally unnecessary. I know, I know what you're thinking. You announce the individual title matches first. Then you do a tag match featuring all the champions. Yeah, and you can have a win on there. The problem is, you know, you got to look at what is being accused of with WWE, especially with those tag titles. I mean, 
Think about this. We have all said that the women's tag team division has been the absolute shits. You look at the tag team women's division, they have to put Natalia and Shayna Baszler together. They had Dana Brooke with somebody at some point. Liv Morgan and Rhea Ripley split. Rhea Ripley and Nikki Ash split. Nikki Ash and Dewdrop are only together for two weeks. So the women's tag team division is in shambles right now. And these women obviously want to be champions, but they want to have championships that actually mean something. And right now they're the tag team champions for a division that is horrible. And they're upset because they're not going to defend the titles until money in the bank. And yes, it's a form of entertainment. Sasha, Naomi, you're not really defending the titles. It's storyline. It's scripted. You know, I honestly don't know why Naomi would not want to face Bianca Belair. And I think a lot of people feel that Sasha, you know, is the one that probably was most irate about this. And Naomi was going to stand by her partner. And they both agreed to walk out together. Um, you know, it, it's rough because you're an employee, independent contractor, you're paid a large amount of money to do a job. But again, WWE makes promises that they don't keep and then they're held accountable for it. And this is why, this is why with the Jeff Hardy incident, with the Mustafa Ali incident, when everybody's doing the hashtag free Ali stuff, I shot that down from day one, and I said, you cannot set this trend that if you're unhappy with your position on TV, that you could just walk out, and then you're get, you get whatever your demands are. That's not how a company runs. Anybody who runs a company will obviously want to nip that in the bud and set an example, say, oh, no, we're not starting that shit then everybody that feels they're not being treated well are just going to you know, walk out and sit out for more demands. Remember, all of these wrestlers know who they're signing with when they sign the dotted line. They know what they're getting into. But when WWE promises things this year and then pulls back on it, and it seems like you know they're doing it and they're being lazy about it, yeah, I think I would be a little, you know, if you look at Sasha's interview with Steve Austin again, you know the aura I got from it? It's that Sasha Banks would rather go to Hollywood. It really feels like Sasha Banks would probably rather do Hollywood than wrestle. I don't know if anybody else got that feeling, but that's the feeling I got, that she would rather be in Hollywood than in the ring. And WWE had to convince her why she should remain in the ring. And a lot of the promises, they overpromised to keep her happy, and now those promises are not delivering. That's how it feels to me. I don't know if 100% sure. I don't talk to them. I don't hang out with them. So, but that's the perception that I get. I don't know how you feel. I see a few people in the chat room agreeing with me 100%. But I definitely get the aura that Sasha, if it was up to her, that she would not be in the ring. Big Armada. Every time he sees Ricky Starks, he looks more and more like a Dwayne Johnson starter kit. Ah. Ricky Starks dresses that way. He styles. He's been doing that for years. It's not a Dwayne Johnson thing. I know more people than you would, re you would think that dress that way. Plus, you know, he's in a warm climate. You know, it's some of it is obviously for show on TV, but Ricky Starks got class. Even Page has a little bit of class himself, but we exposed that time when he was buying those $6 shirts from Sheen. Man, I posted that and man, I got buried so quickly. He did not want to reveal that he was buying $10 shirts at Sheen. But Ricky Starks, you know, he's styling. He's styling. KD. Yes, many complained about the Jokers, and we did. But 
if they told us in advance who the Jokers would be, you would be interested in watching those specific matches. It was all for ratings. Of course it was all for ratings. There was no reason to put, you know, to announce in advance, you know, Johnny Elite, keep thinking impact. You know, the Jokers just felt like fill-ins. There's so many people on that roster that would be more fitting for the Owen Hart Foundation Tournament. Jo Johnny, I didn't mind all that much, but you got to realize who his opponent is, Samoa Joe. Um, you're putting a high flyer, somebody, you know, look, when John Morrison was in WWE towards the tail end, when they were doing Thunderdome still, what's the feud that everybody went nuts for? His, his matches with Ricochet. You look at one of your favorite matches ever in Lucha Underground. It's him versus Santos Escobar when he was under the mask. You put Johnny, Johnny Nitro, Johnny Thunder, Johnny whatever you want to call him, John Morrison, who has unbelievable matches with hello, fellow high flyers, and you put him against Samoa Joe. That felt like a fantasy match with Tony Khan. Oh, my God, I love John Morrison. Can we get him in for one shot? Well, we can only put him against Samoa Joe. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. The matchup sucked. The matchup should not have been in the first place. None against him, but what you saw yesterday, they deserved a shitty match like that because he should be facing Ray Phoenix. He should not be facing Samoa Joe. And as far as Maki Ito, like I said, you know, on Heart Foundation Tournament, Maki Ito, with all due respect, come on. It's ridiculous. They should have never been in those matches in the first place, in my opinion. The villain, the villain. Do I think Mandy Rose will be received, will receive a push when she returns to the main roster? What do I think of Mandy Rose's title reign? Mandy Rose's title reign has been better than I expected. WWE's done a great job to downplay Io Shirai, downplay Alba Fire, downplay uh, some other wrestlers. Raquel Gonzalez has been brought up to the main roster now. So they have done a great job evening, uh, evening the playing field amongst the women. They've done an excellent job with that. So um, she has done a great job. I honestly can say I never expected this run to be as good as it is. Um, she goes to the main roster. I don't know if she would immediately be pushed into the spotlight because there's so many women that she'd have to leapfrog. Why would she overtake? You know, you look at that main roster, as thin as it is, there's about six to eight women that you know Mandy Rose is not going to leapfrog. You know, they're trying to figure out how to give that perception about Liv Morgan. But the fact is, Liv Morgan is not overtaking Rhea Ripley. She's not overtaking Bianca Belair. She's not overtaking Oscar. She's not overtaking Becky Lynch. So they got to give this perception that she's being pushed, but she really isn't. So, no, I don't think Mandy Rose would. I don't think she would get that spot. So. Anyway, um, tonight's episode is brought to you by Manscaped. And, you know, I was checking out a couple of surveys. I saw it on their website, and I'm like, I got to check this out. And I was like, oh, this is pretty, pretty legit. Do you know that 96% of partners think that bad grooming is a major turnoff? So especially for the guys out there, you know, you're with your significant other, whether you have your M&Ms with peanuts or without, you look down there and it looks like, you know, like, you know, a grassland. You could grow corn down there. I don't think it looks all that good. So Manscaped, I got this as a gift. And like I said, I would never push anything on this show unless I not only like the product, or you, I have to use it as well. And Manscaped has a deal going on right now. 
Um, two different deals because Manscaped is not just, you know, down there, but it's also up here. It's, it's everything about a man. That's why I call it Manscaped. They have a package out called the Ultra Smooth Package. And I actually have it. I have the razor right here, and it's pretty cool because it's rechargeable. You just sit it on the charger and it charges right up. Basically, what it is is you groom down there. You don't have to go bald eagle. You don't have to be like an infant. I mean, I don't like that, but you know, you try to trim the hedges and you try. Hey, look, I know Jim Cornette has pushed this. He's the one that got me to look into Manscaped from checking out his show. But they have a deal right now. That's actually a different deal. This is one deal right now. It comes in this box. It's called the Ultra Smooth Package. And, you know, some guys out there, if you're dating a woman, and you live together, you might sneak and use the pink razor and, you know, clean yourself down there. You don't need to use women's razors anymore. They're not meant for us. You get ingrown hairs. You get cuts. And that sucks, especially if you try to get a little intimate and you got a little cut, and, you know, it opens up and uh, yeah, that's not good. So the ultra smooth package, you get the crop shaver razor, you get the crop exfoliator and you get the crop gel. The exfoliator, it gets your skin nice and smooth. Yeah, I, I, and some people are like, oh, this is a little uncomfortable. Well, you're probably one of those that probably have ton, you know, tons of weeds down there. You look at my neck and do a Google map search of Howard Beach, where I live, and go check out 164th Avenue. And look at that. And I guarantee you, some, of, some people tuning in right now, that's what it looks like down there. It's like bushes six feet high in the air. Probably hide some dead people out there. You get the crop exfoliator. It's got ingredients that soothe and clear and keep your skin nice and soft. So when you trim it, you know, the skin is like, you know, the hairs are perked up and waiting to be trimmed. You got the crop gel that gets you all prepared, it's just like the face, you know, but it's meant for down there. It doesn't burn. It's nice and cool. I've used it. And then uh, the big boy, you get the crop shaver and you turn it on and you go down there and uh, you have a comb. And the rest is history. So, listen, I, I'm not just saying this. I don't get anything out of this. If you go to manscaped.com and you shop around, they have that package and another package that I have. This is the package that I got. Let me show you a better picture of it. That is the Performance Package 4.0. You get the lawnmower. You get the weed whacker, you get the crop reserver, the crop reviver, you get magic mats, you also get a cool shirt, you get a, a bag with it, a travel kit, and if you go to Manscaped right now, anything that you order, if you enter the promo code Don Tony, you get 20% off your order. And see this package? Yeah, it comes with the newspaper too. They save our balls. I'm, I'm telling I when Renee said, hey, you want to plug this? I'm like, sure. And I'm like, hey, your balls will thank you. I'm like, I'm going to talk about balls on a show, but it's true. It's true. I tried it and I used it. I mean, me, I just, you know, I, I tried like, you know, you, you remember when we showed Get the F Out a couple of weeks ago? Remember that old lady that was trimming the hedges? when WW FE turned into WWE, they got the F out and they just trimmed the hedges nice and neat. That's what yours truly does. You could go bald Eagle if you want, but this, you know, this is the right way to do it. You use the gel, the exfoliator, it gets you prepared. You trim no, no rash, no ingrown hairs after. And believe me, I tell you a significant other will probably thank you, but father's day is coming up. And I'm not going to lie. I thought about getting one for my father. And I'm like, I don't know if that's appropriate. Hey, dad, here's a kit. Shave your balls. But then I'm like looking at it. I'm like, you know what? I think he probably would appreciate that. So I actually picked him up the kit that you see on this on the screen. It comes with a nose trimmer. 
It comes with, you know, trimmer for your like sideburns and everything. It's not just for down there, down where, down there, but it's up here as well. That kit right now, if you bought it separately on that website, you'd pay $217. Right now on that website, it's $124. And if you put in the promo code Don Tony, you pay $99 and you get free shipping. That is what I got my father for Father's Day. And I'll be more than happy the next week to show you the receipt. So uh, check it out. Get something for yourself. And, you know, if you have someone out there, especially for Father's Day, you think they could use it. I think, look, you get. If you want to be like general about it, you get the regular package. So they're like, hey, you got a problem with my balls? You're like, no, no, it's just a kit. You know, overall, you use what you want. So pretty cool, pretty cool. The nose trimmer is outstanding. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. When I first opened up the show, I was actually going to simulate that I was shaving. And I'm like, I think that's a little bit weird. But no, manscaped.com, great website, great gifts. And uh, look, free shipping, you can't go wrong. And 20% off, you use the promo code Don Tony. And if any of you do shop there, let me know what you think about the items. So like I said, you will never, ever see me plug anything on any of these shows unless I use it and I recommend it. And guys and gals, I was blown away when I got that. So, all right. All right. So back to the show. Back to the show. We're at an hour and 38 minutes, so I will spend another 20 minutes. No rush. We go two-hour show tonight. Uh, Saturday, like I said, we got a lot of stuff to get into. Oh, don't forget. Don't forget, besides the watch parties on Friday, we have the title unification, the tag title. I thought I had a picture of it, but we don't need it. The Usos versus RK Bro. I still think they're going to a no contest. It just, it just doesn't feel as important as it was before. Randy Orton putting a random tweet, them talking about it a little bit on Monday, it doesn't feel anywhere as important. I think Drew McIntyre gets involved. Roman Reigns obviously gets involved. I have a feeling it could be a double disqualification or a no contest. That's where I think. So ooh, we will see. And I just drop water everywhere. That's all right. All right. Tim Keel says long promo. Oh, you know, I wanted to plug it and I wanted to be very thorough about it because I like it. And like I said, you know, I don't get nothing out of that. But uh, thank you. And my balls, thank you as well. It's weird. It's funny when I'm looking at it like, hey, talk about this, this, and this. And don't forget, bring up your balls. I'm like, you got like a weird fetish about testicles. Clean, groomed testicles it's all right i i know tim everybody loves it uh in a few moments i want to read you uh zachary wentz aka nash carter's apology about the nazi photo i think it's very important to bring up tonight uh rams fan did i get your cm punk versus terry funk question i don't know where you gave that to me but you are more than welcome to post it again now Post it again now. I'll be more than happy to answer it. If you're asking me who would win in that match, I'm going to give you an answer you're not going to like. Um, I never like to answer those matches because it's entertainment. Like, if you're going to say to me who would win in a real fight, then that's different. Then that's different. Um, if, you're, if you're asking me how I would book CM Punk versus Terry Funk, did I ever watch CM Punk versus Terry Funk? No. No. And um, I'm assuming this is probably mid-2000s you're talking about. If it is, Terry Funk was obviously past this prime. Um, I saw him take on Low Life Louie around 2004 or five, And, you know, I loved it. But he obviously couldn't do anywhere near as much as he would. CM Punk would go over, I think. I think he would go over. Terry Funk and Ring of Honor against CM Punk? I, I don't remember that, but you know what? It's possible. It's very possible. Um, Nash Carter removed from the WWE downloadable content. Yeah, WWE is... I, I know some people feel they're being a little bit 
overly harsh with Nash Carter with this, but um, you know, it's it's messed up. It's messed up. Um Cap Terry Funk is already in the WWE Hall of Fame. Is Terry Funk's in WWE Hall of Fame already? Uh I I don't recall Terry Funk versus CM Punk at Ring of Honor. Could very well have happened. If it happened, it's probably an indie show, but if it did happen in Ring of Honor, I'm surprised it wasn't celebrated more because I think that would be more of a legendary match that people would talk about. Uh, Nash Carter's statement, I'll read it to you now because I'll be honest with you. I think um, I think he is genuinely remorseful. Uh, one thing about his statement really was glaring. And I said something on Tuesday that kind of, uh, you know, kind of ruffled some feathers. I'll read you his statement. I'll tell you how I feel about it. He says, and I quote, no words can truly describe how ashamed and apologetic I am for my conduct in that photograph. There's no excuse for such behavior, and I take full responsibility for my actions and, and ask for forgiveness. That picture was taken in 2015, a time where I was uneducated in the topic therefore didn't understand the magnitude of how hurtful it was. In 2020, someone was trying to extort me by threatening to post it on social media. I sent it to my wife to discuss the situation. Apparently, she kept it and then decided in retaliation for the divorce filing to post it on social media. Regardless how the photograph came to light, there is still no excuse for my actions. Over the past month, I have taken time to reflect on my conduct to which I express my utmost remorse and regret. I have spent time off of social media to refresh and re-educate myself about the horrors of the Holocaust. I truly do hope that this situation will teach and bring awareness to a terrific tragedy that took place so that something like this will never happen again. I can assure you that this is not who I am, nor what I represent as a human being. And I feel it is never too late to educate and better yourself. If you are ever in the Orlando area, take some time to visit the Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center of Florida, where you can learn about the history and depth of what took place. It was incredibly eye-opening and an impactful experience that teaches the importance of this history. I believe his apology is 100% genuine. What's interesting is that if you go by his timeline, he posed at 21 years old. Now, not trying to be lighthearted about it, but it's pretty obvious that he was spending too much time in the wrestling ring and not much time in social studies class. Because at 21 years old, you probably by now would have been taught about the Holocaust. But as he said, it is never too late to educate yourself. And I will repeat what I said on Tuesday. This is why I believe slavery, Holocaust, Hitler, all of the awful evil that has happened in history needs to remain in the history books, needs to be taught in schools. Does not, it shouldn't, and definitely should not be erased from history because if you don't educate people about the evilness of slavery, Harriet Tubman is not a, is not a hero. If you don't teach what racism was like in the forties, the fifties, the thirties, the sixties, especially early earlier, why is Jackie Robinson such a hero? You have to teach the evil so when you learn it, you're like, oh, I would never do that. That is terrible, disgusting. That I can't understand how our history, you know, allowed that. I would never do that. So, you know, imagine going to school and stuff with the Holocaust and stuff is removed from the textbooks. And then you really don't know the depth of what happened. 
and you, you shave, you trim. I'm not making an excuse for him, but you could see how somebody could easily fall into that. Shaving down. Hey, look, I look, what do you think somebody's going to say? Hey, I look like Charlie Chaplin. No, they're going to say I look like Hitler. And he does the stupid pose. Now he educated himself now. And it's never too late to educate yourself. I truly believe that he is remorseful. He has shown no evidence of being racist, bigot, or anything. There's no evidence of it, you know, like any type of behavior like that. So this, unfortunately, was an awful joke. And, you know, like we talked about also, I mean, it's just as awful that, you know, his wife kept it in the bag, you know, like, and threw it out there because they were getting divorced. All right, you're ruining my life. I'll take you down with me. You know, it doesn't justify or it doesn't make that situation any better, but um, that's his apology. And uh, I think he deserves a second chance. You know, that, that took place in 2015, seven years ago. He's got seven years of a track record that shows no evidence of any type of misbehavior like that. So now he is much more aware. And few, few people ask me, do I think he'll ever be back in WWE? And my answer is yes. I think he will. Uh, Tim, right now my favorite shows, I like watching a lot of history on YouTube. I like learning a little bit about the 1800s, early 1900s, you know, even with diseases and stuff like that. I like watching a lot of cri criminal history stuff. Uh, watching all the mobsters now doing all their podcasts, Sammy the Bull and, you know, Trenkazy and all these, they're all doing p podcasts now, talking about all the times that they whack people. It's weird because some of those faces, like, you know, back in the day, you know, I saw them up close and personal. You know, it's wild. You know, that one time that I was at the coffee shop, you know, John at John Gotti's coffee shop in 1985. You know, Gene Gotti is the one that brought us there because I, his nephew, I worked with in a meat store. And, you know, then you see videos now about how they did this, they did that. It's like, oh, my God. No wonder why my father wanted to beat the shit out of me when I told him that I was at the, the, the fish club, sitting outside thinking that I'm a gangster. Okay, Ramson, thank you. CM Punk. Versus Terry Funk took place in Ring of Honor, September 2003. I'm going to go search it online. I'm going to go watch it if it's online. I don't mind seeing it. I mean, look, a sign of the future in wrestling, which is CM Punk and Terry Funk, who, who yeah, was past his prime. But, you know, I watched Terry Funk, many Terry Funk matches around that time. Look, the XPW stuff was 0203, mostly 02. So that's right around that time. All right, will John Morrison be in AEW dark by week three? He's not under contract with them. Right now, it's a one-shot deal. See how he did. Um, again, you know, I don't know how they viewed this. I mean, he said he's open to working with AEW again in the future, but, man, that camera stuff was awful. Uh, I don't know why they kept the camera on that soon as he started doing that, switch the camera angle, something. I mean, thank God they don't do the WWE stuff where it's back and forth with the camera. I mean, you get dizzy with that stuff. But, you know, sometimes if you see that the camera's in, an, in a position where it might be a little too revealing, switch it. Switch it. All right. Let's see what else. John Vickers, I talked about Ric Flair having one last match on Monday. Uh, you know, it's strange. You know, I brought up Monday that if, I, if the Tennessee State Athletic Commission is fine and they feel Ric Flair is healthy enough to do this, then go for it. I don't have to watch it. Uh, Ric Flair, obviously, wrestling is his life. He wants that adrenaline rush one more time to be in front of the fans, to do what he loves. It must be heart-wrenching to get to an age that you can't do what you always wanted to do. So I feel bad for the man. 
I mean, I really, really do. I don't believe this is a money grab. And I know that's strange to say. It. This is not a money grab, in my opinion. This is one last opportunity to be in front of the fans like that. Um, but what I'm starting to find out is that the Tennessee State Athletic Commission is pretty much non-existent. I think that is the only reason why Ric Flair is having this match. I think once SummerSlam was announced to be in Tennessee and Conrad was bringing back StarCast and they realized what the State Athletic Commission looks like in Tennessee, I think that's what opened up this opportunity. So uh, I'm still working on it. Um, I just hope to God he doesn't get injured. I hope to God he doesn't drop dead. Um, if something happens, you know, who, who do you hold accountable? Ric Flair, obviously, but I also feel, well, just be, you know, just because he wants to do it, you let him do it. There's a lot of things that we would want to do that we shouldn't do. You know, it, that's moronic. Oh, if he wants to do it, let him do it. You know, that's why this isn't a kid like, oh, you know, he wants, he wants to go to the movies. Oh, he wants to go, you know, drive for the first time by himself. Oh, let him do it. You know, it, no, it's medically, you know, but I'm here in Tennessee is very re relaxed with that stuff. So the match is going to go on. Since Ricky Steamboat is not doing it, I think Sting is probably the only other ideal choice. It's got to be somebody who he's very closely tied to in his career. I think Sting may possibly be the one. He may be the only one. You could get Tully Blanchard and others. I think it would be awful. But I think Sting might be the only chance. I personally think it should be a tag match. This way, if he can't, he can tag out and let somebody else finish. Run DMG. Do I think Eddie Kingston could become AEW World Heavyweight Champion? It could happen. It would be almost like the ultimate underdog because he looks like the everyday person you know, and, I, and that's what fans love about Eddie Kingston. They feel like they can relate in some way to him. That could happen. Um, I don't know when it could happen. It doesn't feel like it's happening anytime soon. But sure, that could happen. Absolutely. Did I like the six-man hell, hell in a Cell? Hell in a Cell didn't even happen yet. What Hell in a Cell are you talking about? Um. DJ's asking, with RK Bros' success, what makeshift tag team is my favorite? Booker T and Goldust. I love the dynamic back then. Um, Booker T still a little bit Harlem Heat with his attitude, and Goldust coming off so innocent, just wanting to be friends. I love that. I love that dynamic. Love that dynamic. Armageddon 2000, I don't remember Armageddon 2000. You know, I, I would have to watch the match again and then tell you how I felt about it. I will say this, you know, there isn't a, you know, there isn't a Hell in a Cell match I don't like. Uh, I think this was a Patreon question Tuesday too. You know, the only Hell in a Cell match to me that felt like a disappointment was the one I think, it, wasn't it Charlotte versus Sasha Banks? They were, that match, they were, that Hell in the Cell, the first ever women's Hell in the Cell, it just felt like it was being done simply because they're women. Um, it just, that felt like a disappointment for me. Um, Rikishi fl flying off the cage, eh, it was a stunt. He landed on a barrel of hay. You know, it was okay. I mean, I give him credit for taking the spot, but, you know, you fall on a nice, I mean, sure, you could slip and try, you know, something tragic could happen, but he fell backwards on the bale of hay. I think that looked, it looked like fun. It looked like you're almost going into a pool. Hey, I want to do that. Uh, Stephanie's absence, we'll talk about it Saturday. I posted the announcement earlier. I'm going to get all the details. And then we will talk about it a little bit further. So, all right. We're going to start bringing this home. 
I'm looking. I don't think we have any other news to get into. We've covered everything. I think we're going to, yeah, because we're almost at two hours. So uh, Saturday, the Don Tony Show, 9.05, no, 8.05 p.m. Yeah, that's right. We start early. 8.05 p.m. I will be right here. We obviously have some pretty serious convo to do. Uh, we're going to talk about what I teased a little bit earlier about, you know, women in wrestling and the promises that are being given and promises that are not being kept. And the fact of the matter is, just in closing, to be continued on Saturday, if WWE, and AEW, and other promotions out there truly believe that women are equally utilized as the men or should be, then how come they're not? AEW has been around for three years. You get one women's match. Oh, you get talking segments, but why is that? And I think little by little, the women wrestlers are realizing it, but they're in a bad situation because they don't want to lose the opportunity that they're, they're being given. But I think a lot of women in wrestling are starting to realize that they have been told a narrative the last bunch of years to appease women. And I think in all of these promoters' eyes, they believe that wrestling is a male-dominated sport. More women watch wrestling, but they don't always watch wrestling because other women are wrestling. Believe me, back in the day when I was doing my hotline in the 90s, you know, a lot of the women that would tune into the hotlines, they were talking about, oh, my God, how sexy this person looks or this person looks or talking about the men, Val Venus and others. They, they, you know, they weren't like, oh, my God, you know, I love Lita. Some of them did, but, you know, people think that your fandomhood of wrestling is based on what gender you are, and that's not true. There's a lot of men that love women's wrestling. There's a lot of women that love men's wrestling. wrestling. But the fact of the matter is, if women sold tickets, merchandise, and were ratings draw and needle movers like the men were, then you would have equal, if not more, featured on TV. And when you see the pattern for one year, two years, three years, you know, when do you be a little honest and say, okay, what the fuck's going on? And that promise on social media has been done through other people in interviews because the promoters never want to be caught on camera saying something like that. Why do you think Tony Khan got so angry at that teenage reporter? that woman reporter that brought up women's wrestling. You see how angry he got? Because they, this is toxic to them. Oh, no, 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 no. We can't have anybody think that. We got we to gotta put the nipple in the mouth like a baby. Hey, women's wrestling. You got a young you being used to the rose again talking. When do people, when do people start really bringing this to the surface? You know? People don't want to because then they realize some of their own favorite promotions are the, the guiltiest culprits of this. So we'll talk about that, and we'll talk a little bit more about the Stephanie situation, and uh, we'll see what happens with the tag team title unification match. Uh, tomorrow we have the watch parties, and don't forget, we will do the Sting giveaway, that autograph photo, since we did not have a winner for the... Uh, the Joker contest. So tomorrow in a watch party, we'll probably do a Rampage ratings predictions contest to keep it easy. Um, we'll give away the Sting photo and $50 gift card. Whoever wins will get both. So we'll give that away tomorrow. And then we got the SmackDown watch party as well. So uh, yeah, Charlie, the, the, the Liv Morgan thing was a scam. It was a scam. I was right. I, I knew I was right. No news organization picked up on it. That's not a story you just ignore. So, yeah, somebody claimed that they sold their house and thinking they were giving it to Liv Morgan, and she felt terrible about it. And then that person, you know, claimed that they lost their life savings, and that was a scam. That person claimed that that was a scammer. So, all right, everybody. Once again, if you enjoyed tonight's show, hit that like button on the way out and post 
your comments in the comment section. If you have any remaining questions that I did not get to answer, post it in the comment section also, and I will be more than happy to answer them. So uh, have a great rest of your evening or day, depending on where you live. Enjoy SmackDown on Friday. Let's see if it ends in a no contest. I'm still going with that. And um, if it, there is a decision, I think the Usos win it. I think the Usos get it. But I still believe it'll be a no contest. And uh, we'll talk about that setting and a bunch of other things. So be well, everyone. Thank you, as always, for the support. Much love. And I will see you all again Saturday night, 8.05 p.m. Be well. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a podcaster. For me to live any other way was nuts. To me, those goody-good people who work shitty jobs for bum paychecks and took the subway to work every day and worried about their bills were dead. I mean, they were suckers. They had no balls. If I wanted something, I just took it. I ran everything. I paid the bills. I paid the host. I even paid the masked maniac. Everybody had their hands out. Everything was for the taking. We always called each other good fellas. You would always hear from somebody. You're gonna like Don Tony. He's all right, he's a good fella. He's one of us. But if you're part of my crew, nobody ever tells you they're gonna get rid of you. It doesn't happen that way. There weren't any arguments or curses like in the movies. See, your haters come with smiles. They come as your friends, the people who've claimed they care the most for your life. And now, now that's all over. And that's the best part. Today everything is different. There's lots of action. I don't have to wait around for everything like everyone else. Oh, I didn't get the vaccine? Fuck you, vaccine me. Oh, your delivery guy has COVID? Fuck you, feed me. Right after I moved here, I ordered egg noodles and ketchup. And I got spaghetti with meat sauce. I'm no longer an average nobody, while they get to live the rest of their lives like a bunch of schnooks.